structural failure is the cause of many problems. In fact, many defendants who come in before the housing court uh, have problems uh, with their homes resulting from structural failure. Porches that uh, are deteriorating, garages that are deteriorating, as well as their home. And there can be many reasons for structural failure, such as water damage or fire damage, but there is even a more pervasive and almost a silent uh, reason for structure failure that we're going to deal with today in this uh, segment of home court. We're here today with Chuck Kettler, uh, who is with a exterminating company who deals with this day in and day out, and uh, you're with Central Exterminating? That's correct. And how long have you been there? Uh, I've been there 22 years. Uh, the company started in 1946. And we uh, outlined uh, one of the concerns that we had today, which was insect infestation. Correct. In the previous versions of home court, we've dealt with cockroach, cockroach infestation. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there is a more silent, less visible sometimes, insect that homeowners are confronted with. Could you outline uh, what those uh, insects are? Well, certainly, uh, if we're talking about the home, uh, which is you know, uh, the most significant investment people normally make, uh, the, the big issue, of course, is wood destroying insect type damage. Uh, when you talk secretive, you talk termites. Uh, something more visible would be carpenter ants, uh, and probably more common in this part of Ohio would be carpenter ants. But we definitely have a, a, a termite presence uh, in the Cleveland metropolitan area, as well as uh, northern Ohio as a whole. Is the presence of termites uh, more pervasive in Cleveland as opposed to other areas or more pervasive in this region? Uh, are, is it because of our soil that's so sandy? Yeah, so soil is, is mm -hmm. critical, mm -hmm. and, and you can have uh, a pocket of problems in a, in a municipal area mm -hmm. and go a mile either direction, and you, you know, it'll be almost impossible to find the same type of a problem. But yet, uh, as you work toward Lorain County, uh, they have a, a large termite uh, potential out there. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time you get to Sandusky and toward Toledo, more people have termites than do not have termites. And you'd have to think that the, uh, the soil is critical. Uh, now, the lots within the city of Cleveland, for the most part, are small lots, uh, 35, 40 feet. Uh, unusual to have 50 or 60 feet. Correct. There are some, but mostly small lots. Mm -hmm. 150, uh, some some 40 by 100. Correct. If there is a termite infestation on one property, what's the likelihood that it could travel down the street to a neighbor? I think it's, it's very likely that the potential is there. And uh, if, if one house is going to have a problem, uh, it could actually be the same colony of termites that have gone both directions and could actually be in both structures. So the one colony can uh, travel how many feet? Well, it's probably hard to put actual uh, feet type of relationships with it, but uh, adjacent parcels would not be unrealistic, front and back, left and right. Now, uh, termites are a, a pest, destroy someone's home. Uh, is any beneficial uh, oh, use absolutely. for termite? We, we, we always try to impress upon people that insects in general aren't pests until they invade your, your living space. I mean, mm -hmm. they... they all have some type of a purpose in the greater scheme of things. Uh, termites are, are invaluable as a, as a forest dweller because this basically is what decomposes uh, the trees after they've fallen down and, and creates uh, the loamy soil as years go by. So in that respect, uh, they're critical to a, to a healthy forest, but when they invade your home on your own personal property, then of course it becomes a, a major problem for the homeowner. I think one of the thing that, things that we've seen in Cleveland's neighborhoods are uh, some of the homes that have been demolished. Uh, there was a period of time when the homes were buried in the yes. foundation hole. And uh, those lots, the property owners who have purchased yep. them through the land bank find that uh, they're starting to sink. Correct. Is that through, uh, could be termite or other type of uh, insect? Uh, it could probably be a combination of insects as well as uh, uh, various types of fungus that, that you know, affect wood that mm -hmm. has, has soil and, and moisture uh, contact. So the uh, mm. parts of the house that are wood are decomposing yes. in a natural state, and of course the soil is then uh, And then if you throw collapsing. termites into the mix, then uh -huh. it just accelerates the, the process. I see. Mm. 
Well, what uh, should a homeowner look out for as far as determining whether or not they have termites or uh, carpenter ants? Well, if they're actually uh, able to visually handle the insects, uh, they have samples in a jar to look at. Uh, when we're talking with homeowners, uh, we always ask them simple questions. As you're looking at the insect, is the, the body the same thickness at the front of the insect as it is at the back? Uh, they say, oh no, it, it has a pinched waist. Well, that automatically is indicating that you have an ant problem, not a termite problem. Mm -hmm. It has that hourglass shape. Uh, if on the other hand, they say, oh no, it's about the same thickness all the way through, and then it's highly likely then we're dealing with a, with a uh, you know a termite situation. The size of the ant, the carpenter ant, is larger than a carpenter ant, larger than a termite. Is that well, right? actually though you can have carpenter ants that are very small. Oh, I see. The, uh, carpenter mm -hmm. ants as a whole have have a, a cast type of, of structure, and you have small workers, and you'll have medium size, and then of course you have the very large ones, which are what people most commonly think of when you say carpenter ants. But they're they're quite varied in their size. So aside from looking at the actual insect, are there some uh, other things you can look for, for instance, evidence of where oh, they've sure. been? Uh, if, if it's a home that has a basement, in, uh, an unfinished basement, where you can see the floor joists uh, and the uh, what's called the sill plate, that, that piece of wood that sits on top of the block foundation. Mm -hmm. uh, if you notice uh, a sandy deposit on the surface, uh, we tell people if you uh, take a little string of, uh, or, or a bead of glue on a piece of paper and dust sand over top and blow the sand away, you end up with a track. And this is what you'll, you'll see on a, on a timber that has termite activity in it. Uh, they've broken through the surface of the wood and then they, they plug it with a frass-like material to keep the humidity inside the, the living space. And then you'll see those tracks or you'll see tubes actually starting to come down like uh, stalactites and stalagmites in a cave you'll see these, uh, these tubes start to drip down from a, from a beam above. And that's classic termite damage. All right. And uh, within the wood, what would you look for? I think you have some examples here. Right. A, a good example would be this uh, larger uh, piece of termite damage that, that we're looking at. And the first clue right off the bat is that it's very dirty in appearance. I mean, in fact, you can actually uh, get the, the muddy material to come off on your fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, this is that frass material that we were talking about that they will plug up the, the outside area where they start to break through. They'll, they'll jam this full of this frass and material. And it's important that they plug it up so that they can keep the moisture level, the humidity Absolutely. level uh, within the, right. the wood. They're very sensitive to, to, to temperature and mm -hmm. so they have to keep that environment very, very close. Conversely, if, if we're talking about carpenter ants, uh, and you're looking at a, a piece of damaged wood that's been removed from the house to be replaced or whatever, what you're going to notice is it's very smooth, very clean. Uh, as they're excavating to make room to expand their colony, they're going to take this chewed wood that, that they're munching on and they're going to be pushing it out of the gallery. And then, of course, that's what you're going to see on the floor of the basement or on a windowsill or underneath the window uh, along a baseboard. So they're they're doing housekeeping all the time, Absolutely. pushing all of the, the wood debris out right. so that the nests uh, on the inside are uh, absolutely clean as opposed to the sandy nests yes. that the termites have. Is there an example of, uh, oh, I see. You can see the galleries here. Yes. Uh, and, and again, they, they, they work through the various layers uh, of the wood. I mean, they, they chew out the, the soft, easy, meaty part of the wood, and then they're going to leave these very these striations in there where the uh, where the wood is more dense and then they just you know uh, hollow out the next gallery and they just keep working through it slowly. Now one of the websites uh, with the uh, University of Toronto uh, talked about termite damage mm -hmm. and they said that if you can't see it from the outside sometimes uh, they've used dogs to uh, yes. to smell termite or carpenter ants as yes. well. No, that's Just strictly the termites. Be, be termites. Uh, mm -hmm. A byproduct of termite populations are methane gas. I see. And, it's, and the dogs smell the, dogs the methane thinking, gas. Right. They also have electronic uh, sniffers, uh, probably a, a similar device to what the uh, the gas company uses when they're looking for, for leaks in their system. Uh, they actually have sniffers that are, are programmed with software to pick up on methane residue. And so you can actually use an electronic device going along the baseboards of a home if you are suspicious that there may be a termite problem. Now the website also uh, <coughs> outlined that you should listen to hear if you hear chewing wood. 
Is that right? Is that uh, correct? It's definitely correct with carp and rams. You can hear they the... Are, uh, yes. If you have a sizable population, uh -huh. uh, it's not unusual for them to get into a hollow door inside of a house. Not an exterior door, but actually an internal door going into a bedroom that has a, a hollow type of structure. And you'll hear them rustling. It, it resembles the, uh, a sound similar to uh, crinkling cellophane. We're going to look at some actual sites of insect infestation. Perhaps you can tell us sure. what uh, we're looking at. And I know uh, one of the examples that you brought was uh, this book on uh, Daniel Boone. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, this is just a good example of, of the books that might have been stored away in the basement. The kids mm -hmm. have grown up. Uh, most every homeowner, you don't want to get rid of things because mm -hmm. you might want to pass them on to grandkids oh, or whatever. Sure. And so they're stored in the basement up against the wall, and they're sort of forgotten. And then there's a reason to go into that box. And then what you find out when you open the box is that you'll see that the termites have gotten into the book, and they have worked their way. Well, we can't see too clearly there. But they've worked their way all the way through the other pages, right through, and it exited the back so of the book. So you can see daylight through this book. Yes. And they've... Uh... And this is a hard... You know, uh -huh. a hard surface book as opposed to a, a magazine. Mm -hmm. However, another example that we have over here uh, was this a spiral binder or some sort of manual type of document, and it is just pretty well destroyed uh, by termites that were working on this particular box. Was this in a basement? Yes, or, uh -huh, as well. So anything cellulose, of course, is is highly favorable for for termites because that's the their main food source. Well, there may be people that are uh, wondering what they should do and uh, should they immediately uh, worry about this problem or can they go through a certain time period to determine if they have termites or mm -hmm. carpenter ants? How long a period do they have before the damage uh, can really well, be that, noticeable? That's, that, that's, that's difficult and, and that sounds like... Uh, uh, an easy way to get around the question, but mm -hmm. uh, termites are slow and persistent. And unless unless you run across a very obvious clue, uh, it can go on for many years before you actually stumble across it. Uh, what normally occurs uh, is house remodeling, uh, the changing of windows, the changing of doors. And when you remove uh, a window casement, then all of a sudden, there's all this, this damage and, and, and then the concern, we have to rush into something and get something done quickly. And that really isn't the case. Uh, in this day and age, the consumer wants to investigate. And now with the internet and so many people having computers in their homes, there's a lot of sources that you can go to to get some background information before you actually you know, take the yellow pages out and start calling companies and, and, and getting, and you should have dip, you know several quotes. Don't just work with just one quote. So you have a, a period of time where you oh, should yes. investigate. Yes. Uh, and you have some websites that you think are of uh, value. Uh, one with the, uh, would that be with the Ohio State yeah, Extension the, well, Service? Uh, or? Yeah, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, actually the High Department of Agriculture oh, I see. Uh, has a consumer uh, section on their website. All right, and we're going to show that website up on the screen. Uh, the Ohio Pest Control Association mm -hmm. uh, as an industry service for, for customers and consumers uh, has a section there as well as the National Pest Con uh, Management Association, which is a much larger uh, national organization, and they have consumer information available also. All right. So there also are some steps that, in choosing someone who's going to be the professional that you should go through uh, and also verify, is there some sort of certification that people must have uh, if they're about to undertake the elimination of termites or carpenter ants? Right. The uh, businesses in Ohio mm -hmm. uh, have to be licensed and they have to have uh, personnel that, that have applicator licenses. Uh, and generally, those companies are also going to have trained staff uh, that are specifically familiar with, with ter uh, termite control uh, options and solutions. Mm -hmm. And they should be able to you know, outline for the customer a, a, a step one, step two, step three process that they're going to use to solve the problem for the consumer. Now, once you've determined that you have termites or carpenter ants, what steps do you need to take to eradicate them? What, are, what is the state of the art within uh, the 
pest control or exterminating mm -hmm. uh, industry to eliminate them? What should people be familiar with? Well, first of all, they should be aware that the industry has changed dramatically in 10 years. The, the traditional way of, of liquid treating a property uh, involves the drilling of concrete block. Mm -hmm. It involves the drilling of the concrete slab in the basement of the home and along the outside of, uh, of the house then would mm -hmm. be the rotting of the soil down to the footer level. Mm -hmm. So consequently, the, the termite operator uh, will be using uh, injectors for concrete block. They're going to be using uh, the longer rod type devices to get down as close to the footer as possible. Uh, it is, it's a precise science in the sense that there's uh, specific amounts of material that have to be uh, applied in intervals to get a good thorough treatment and then understand that the, the theory behind the treatment is as you're working your way around the property, as you're making your application, you are relying then on the liquid treatment to spread out and come in contact with the next application mm -hmm. that's 18 to 24 inches away from it. And then eventually that creates a barrier underneath the soil and in those cavities within the walls down to the foundation that will prohibit the termites from re-entering the structure. Does that chemical barrier create an odor and is it uh, toxic to homeowners? Well, there's always some odor. Mm -hmm. uh, Homeowners are renters. <laughs> yes, uh, un un uh -huh. un unfortunately, it's it's not as pronounced as a lot of the older products. Were, I see. But there there is an odor factor. Uh, generally, it's mild. Uh, someone that's very sensitive, though, could could, you know, uh, argue that it's it's very noticeable. So sensitivity is a personal kind of issue. Understand that the holes are always plugged after the treatment. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're left open and these vapors can mm -hmm. continue to emerge, you know, into the living space. Uh, but that is, that's the original way of, of treating for termites, and it's still available today. It's mm -hmm. not that, that, that this has gone away. It's always an option. Uh, what a lot of companies now have gone to are baiting type of services that will use the type of uh, stations that we're looking at here. Uh, and this involves uh, using an auger uh, to make this pocket or this chamber in the soil around the outside perimeter of the house. Mm -hmm. Then the unit is dropped in, and then inside of the unit then are, are special uh, pine blocks. Mm -hmm. And then these are installed. The uh, This fits flush to the ground. The cap goes back on and locks into place, and then the holder comes off so mm -hmm. it's, it's not tamper. Uh, it's it's sort of tamper resistant at that point, so uh, children aren't going to be getting into it. You haven't seen my dog. <laughs> well, I, 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 we won't speak about dogs because dogs can be a challenge. Right. Uh, and then these typically then are monitored on mm -hmm. some type of a cycle, and the termite uh, technician is going to come out. He's going to open this up. He's going to be looking for termite activity. How long will it take for the uh, if there is termite activity for the termites to go in and chew that block up? They could find it in a month, and we've had uh, we've had structures that have gone the better part of a year before they they get hit. Oh, all right. <clears throat> so this is this is one manufacturer's line. Uh, Dowalanco is uh, another manufacturer of uh, termite baiting systems. Their mm -hmm. system is a little bit different in that they use they use a bar coating arrangement on their cap. Mm -hmm. So uh, a, a pest control company that is utilizing a Centricon system. Uh, they come out on a regular monitored cycle. They use a bar reader to monitor each station, and there may be mm -hmm. 25 or 30 stations around a property. It's not unusual. In fact, that's probably pretty typical. Mm -hmm. And then these then are loaded onto a database and actually then is downloaded to the manufacturer who monitors the pest control company's operation working with the Centricon system. And then if there's active feeding going on, uh, the operator may be out there twice a month. They'll certainly be out there once a month. And if the stakes that he pulls out, and he's going to be making an inspection of these stakes, if he pulls them out and he finds that they've been hit by termites, then instead of putting stakes back in, then they're going to take a bait tube with a toxicant material Actually, uh, their product is what's called an ins insect growth regulator. 
and it interrupts the biological life cycle of the insect. Mm -hmm. And they drop it in there, then the cap goes back on. Easy for me to say. Locks into place, and then the key comes out, and then it's mm -hmm. going to sit there for a period of time until he comes back and makes another inspection. What period of time uh, does this process take usually? As we had mentioned, the feeding can start within a month, feeding on the pine stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have termites feeding on the stakes, he's going to recruit those termites in a container. He's going to put the bait tube in. He's going to put the termites back into the station because they're already going to the station. Mm -hmm. They'll start to feed on this material, and then they're going to start to track back and forth to the main colony. The main colony then becomes infected with the material by the sharing of the food source, and then that's how colony elimination begins. How long a process is that? Uh, upwards of a year. All right. It's, it's a slow process. I know that people who discover that they do have termites, uh, given the nature of our society, want them eliminated immediately. And I know that there's, I've read about heat treatments, freeze treatments, mm. electrical treatments. Yes. I haven't heard about nuclear treatments, but I'm sure if that was available, uh, people would want to right. utilize that. So there is a, a slow process yes. because the process of having termites uh, come into one's home is also a slow process. Yes. Mm -hmm. Even with a liquid treatment, once you have your barrier in place, part of that population that's already in the house uh, is going to remain active for a period of time. Now with the barrier, they're not going to get back to the soil. And unless we don't have a, a second moisture problem in the structure, the ones in the structure are going to die off. With the baiting, the, the consumer has to remember that there's no barrier. You have this perimeter of stations around the property, and when the feeding begins, it will feed for a, a period of time. It could be three, four, six months. It, it could feed for a year, depending on the size of the colony. The feeding then is going to stop, and then the process is to put monitoring blocks back in, but it's a perpetual service. If they have the, the, the thinking that my termites are gone so I don't need the service any longer, they have to remember there's nothing out there to try to intercept a new colony of termites coming into the area. Mm -hmm. They'll get back into the house and then they'll be starting all over if they don't keep the program running. What do you need to do for a carpenter ants? It's a little different method. Yeah, well, it's altogether different. Mm -hmm. uh, Termites are subsoil invaders and dwellers. Uh, carpenter ants, of course, you'll find in, in doors and houses. You'll find them in, in, the, the, in dishwashers, the insulated wrap around the dishwasher. You can find them in the insulation in the attic of a home. They can be all over. Uh, normally, there's a relationship with moisture. And we, 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 we typically ask customers, uh, have you noticed any moisture problems in the house, any water marks on drywall, uh, on ceilings? It would indicate moisture coming in because that helps to 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 find the needle in a haystack mm -hmm. because you're dealing with pockets usually not not necessarily huge numbers uh, although you could have a couple of hundred which is a lot but it can be clustered in just one spot now there's one queen with every nest yes. in carpenter ants yes. and if you eliminate the queen you eliminate the nest is that right in most cases yes mm -hmm. because there's this relationship with the colony that is actually quite fragile, and when you disrupt it to any any degree, uh, you, you, you're normally going to have a lot of mortality tied in with the, with that colony. How far will a carpenter ant travel uh, for uh, food or on its uh, from its nest? Uh, well, outside? it's not unusual to to uh, hear tracking stories uh, of uh, uh, 200 250 feet from a primary source, mm -hmm. and people say, well. Uh, where could they be coming from? And then we'll normally ask, uh, is the house on a wooded setting? Well, we have several large trees, but they're way at the back of the property. Uh, those trees could be the, the primary source. Now, mm -hmm. they look healthy. Uh, they, they may be large maple trees or oak trees. Uh, but the, generally, the center part of the tree, when the, when the tree is aging, becomes soft and, and susceptible to, to ant infestation and that may be the bulk, and they constantly radiate out like the spokes of a wheel. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for food sources, they're looking for other places to expand the colony. And that's how they can typically then work their way into a house, uh, either through where the utilities come in for air conditioning units or, 
electric lines are coming in for power So you need boxes. to caulk all those Absolutely. holes, those access points, and they're looking for uh, nesting areas where right. there's moisture. As well Is that as what food. carpenter ants and right. food? And food. All right. And what type of food, uh, since they don't eat the wood, what type of food do they look for? Their diet is wide and varied. Uh, mm. They'll eat insects, they'll eat sweets, they'll eat proteins. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the treatments that, that pest control companies can provide to the consumer for non-carpenter ant situations now involve a lot of baiting possibilities. We have a lot of baits on the market. Uh, pest control companies as a whole are trying, I think, for a large part to, to temper the use of a lot of liquid pesticides mm -hmm. because the the consumer today is, is a lot more aware of concerns about toxicity and, and chemical interaction. Right. If it'll kill the ant or the termite, right. it, it might have a negative effect on Absolutely. the human being. And especially mm -hmm. if there's skin sensitivities or respiratory sensitivities, mm -hmm. these become major concerns. So we have a lot of baits for pavement ants and, and, and various type of ground invading ants. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, carpenter ants don't always respond well to baits. And I don't know that our industry as a whole or research as a whole has figured out why that is. Mm -hmm. But one day they might like sweets and you can put a sweet based bait out there and the next day they'll walk right past it and won't even look at it. Mm -hmm. And then they'll be going for a protein or a fish based type of bait. But two days later they won't, they won't react to that. So we're, we, we work constantly experimenting with baits for carpenter ants, but usually it comes down to dust type of treatments in wall cavities and voids and still a certain amount of barrier liquid treatments to get a handle on them.